morning, everyone. It's really a delight to be here this morning. Before I do anything, I want to thank the members of the Zonta Club for the armband and ask them to stand up. I really appreciate these sisters being here. The armband says, make every woman matter. And that's something that I'll touch on a bit in our lecture this morning. <laughs> so again, it's delightful to be back at Chautauqua. And my charge today is to talk about radicalism in the civil rights and women's rights movements. And it's very interesting to talk about radicalism because the question is always, radicalism for whom? Paul Ryan, the recently nominated vice presidential candidate, says that his budget is radical. And if you look at the um, dictionary definition of radical, favoring drastic political, economic, or social reform, one might have to agree. But because I see radical as also progressive, I would describe Mr. Ryan's budget as reptilian as opposed to <laughs> radical. People can use the words in any way they want. What I've titled my lecture today is Civil Rights, the Civil Rights Movement, a Crucible for Radical Transformation in the United States and Elsewhere. My definition of radical is a little bit different uh, from the dictionary definition. I would describe radicalism as an unwavering commitment to, social, to progressive social and economic justice. Again, an unwavering commitment to, to uh, progressive social and economic justice. Because the question is always radical for whom? Both the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, and the other movements that succeeded that uh, were not particularly radical to the people who founded those movements. I mean, what's so radical about human rights? What's so radical about inclusion? What's so radical about looking at the Constitution that talks about the foundational Constitution, which talks about the human rights of human beings? Is it radical to allow us to make the um, Constitution, which many people ratified, uh, a reality and not just, just, not just theory? Of course, however, we would have to go back to the way the Constitution was put together and remind ourselves that John Adams and Thomas Jefferson had a historic uh, disagreement about what would happen to uh, the rights of African American people, as well as women that Abigail Adams actually wrote John Adams a letter as they were putting the Constitution together that said, don't forget the women. That John Adams actually wrote to Thomas Jefferson that the Negro question, I don't think they used the word Negro then, uh, but I won't repeat what he used, uh, this question will uh, plague us until we work it out. In other words, they understood that making black people three-fifths of a person as part of the uh, amendments for the sake of counting is something that will come back to haunt them. Um, so the question is, did people who were excluded consider it radical that they were to be excluded uh, when they understood that systems and laws emerged to reinforce inequality? What was radical about the civil rights movement is that it was wholly unexpected that opposed people would stand up for themselves and offer resistance to the status quo. That it was wholly unexpected that contextually, one group's audacity would basically inspire others. It was wholly unexpected that there would be resistance, not only standing up, but resistance to the status quo. Let me remind, let me remind you of what the status quo looked like in the 1950s. African Americans were segregated. There were still signs in parts of the South that said white or colored. There were still drinking fountains that people could not drink from. There were still places that people could not go. There were still signs that said no Negroes need apply. Women, by and large, were segregated to the kitchen. Those women who transcended roles of wife and mother were awfully seen as aberrant. Um, gay people, gay and lesbian people, were in the closet. In fact, we didn't often use the words gay and lesbian. The words that were used were homosexual. Latinos, Native Americans, and Asian Americans were rarely mentioned. And there was resistance to those who were other in different ways. Jewish people, for example, and Catholics were somehow seen as other, and it was okay. 
So exclusion was the name of the game. Now, for many people, the 60s seemed like a spontaneous combustion, but actually there's a history of resistance, usually failed, but resistance nonetheless that picked away at the status quo, at the white male hegemony that dominated our society. Some will paint the Montgomery bus boycott as a starting point of the 60s uh, rebellion, and certainly Dr. Martin Luther King became a national figure because of the Montgomery bus boycott. Others would look at the 1960s sit-ins, Woolworths in Greensboro, North Carolina, as a moment of riveting attention. But actions like both these actions occurred high, and before highly publicized actions occurred. For example, in 1956, the same year as the Montgomery boycott, Claudette Colvin refused to give up her seat. It was nine months before Rosa Parks. But what was wrong? Claudette Colvin was not the ideal plaintiff in the lawsuit. Claudette Colvin was 15 years old, hot-headed, and pregnant. And therefore, in the, and unmarried, by the way, and therefore, in the 1950s, she was not seen as someone the community should rally around. Also, Rosa Parks sit in, sit down, as now has become a cliche, to sit down so others would never, would, could get up. Rosa Parks did not spontaneously decide one day that she was just tired. The fact is that she was an active member of the NAACP, and there had been talk and organization and protests all along, internal discussion about how they would begin to dismantle segregation on the buses. Similarly, 1958 in Wichita, Kansas, the late Ron Walters, political scientist, um, longtime uh, associate of Reverend Jesse Jackson, uh, Congressman Conyers, and many others, but Ron at, he was 20 years old, organized a sit-in at Duckham Drugstore, again in Wichita. Of course, this didn't make headlines, but there are a number of sit-ins at public, public places that took place before the Greensboro sit-in. And again, the Greensboro sit-in, the Woolworth sit-in, was not the spontaneous action one might think. Indeed, as President Emerita of Bennett College for Women, I'm delighted to note that both Bennett College is about across the street from North Carolina uh, A&T State University where the four young men were enrolled. But because North Carolina A&T was a state university, basically obstructive legislatures could order presidents as to what to do. Because Bennett College is a private college, the first college to invite Dr. Martin Luther King to speak in Greensboro, North Carolina, where the pre then president, Willoughby Player, said, we don't teach our children what to think, our students what to think, we teach them how to think. Dr. Player had a political science professor that was meeting with students at both colleges to talk about when they might effectively uh, sit in at Woolworths. Indeed, the young men thought that November would be a great time to sit in. They'd been working for a whole year, and they thought November would be a great time. Dr. Player said to them, if you sit in in November and you go home for Christmas, the momentum would be lost. And so they went out on February 1st. Again, this is often seen as they just sat down because they wanted something to eat, but instead it came out of an organized movement. One of the things that is not often told, and my, uh, one of my lines is that history belongs to she who holds the pen, is that there were women there as well that the women of Bennett College for Women, as well as the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, which was at that time a women's college, were also in the Woolworths. Of course, they didn't sit down because women didn't do that then. Uh, chivalry prevented them from sitting where people would throw mustard or throw matches at them, but they were, in, they were there and this is often unrecorded. But in any case, this also was not a spontaneous combustion. So people like to think of this as something that just happened, as the 60s, as something that just happened. But when you go back and look through history, you'll find that none of this just happened, that there were seeds of uh, rebellion uh, that were sown as early as, in the case of African Americans, the late 17th, early 18th century. Um, one of the things that um, leaps out is David Walker's appeal it was written in 1919, forgive me, 1829. And it was so incendiary that it was against the law for you to be found with or to distribute David Walker's appeal.